Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Current Fatigue Analysis Recommended Practices and Implications on Offshore Structural Integrity, hosted by the IMEC-E and brought to you today by the Structural Technology and Materials Group. So a bit of housekeeping to start with. The session today is one hour. We will proceed with the presentation, which is approximately 40 minutes in length, and then we'll have some time at the end for a Q&A session. You'll see a Q&A session box in which you'll be able to write and submit any questions you have either during the presentation or at the end. At the end of the presentation, I will read out the questions to our presenter who will answer them um, verbally. Alternatively, if it is more suitable, a written response can be given. So we are very fortunate today to have my colleague Amir Chahardane as our speaker. Amir is a principal engineer and technical lead at Kent, formerly Atkins. Kentec acquired Atkins Oil & Gas Offshore Wind and Low Carbon Services recently, and we have now joined forces with them as a new exciting company called Kent. So Amir has over 15 years of industry experience specialising in fatigue and fracture assessments of offshore renewables and oil and gas structures. Amir manages and technically leads complex projects ranging from inspection planning to repair, operations and design. Outside of Atkins, he is an industry advisor to the REMS Doctoral Training Centre at Cranfield University and sits on the advisory panel for the Strathclyde University's Naval Architecture, Ocean and Marine Engineering Department. Before joining Atkins, he was an academic in Cranfield, where he is now a visiting lecturer teaching structural integrity to MSc students. I'm very much looking forward to this talk. It is very relevant to the work we do in relating fatigue data to practical offshore design and integrity applications. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Amir. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, as the case might be. Today, I'm going to talk to you about some aspects of fatigue calculations and their relevance to structural integrity. And the main focus is on um, offshore structures. Let me first give you an overview of the talk. Um, I'll be talking about the structural integrity in, within the context of uh, the offshore environment. And then I'll give a very brief background to SN calculations for fatigue to the extent that is required to be able to follow to the end of the presentation. Uh, I'll talk about the uh, current um, fatigue best practice and guidelines um, and the connections between fatigue and integrity um, through inspection planning as a way of maintaining integrity. And at the end, I'll give a couple of examples to, to illustrate the, uh, uh, the discussion. So what is meant by structural integrity? Um, if you imagine um, an offshore structure, which could be oil and gas platform or an offshore wind uh, support structure, such as a monopile, for example, um, this structure throughout its life will experience repeated loading from wave action. Um, and where there is repeated loading, there is propensity for fatigue, which is crack initiation and propagation, which happens under uh, cyclic loading. Of course, the severity uh, of this fatigue regime depends on the geographic geographical location. Um, and as time goes by, because of the repeated wave action, the probability of fatigue failure increases. Um, um, and that there are methods that can be used to, um, to maintain integrity of the structure. One such um, method is inspection um, and this would actually help us in understanding the fatigue status of the structure better. And I will talk about this in the next slides. But first I'll give a very brief uh, background to SN fatigue and testing. So let's consider there are a number of identical specimens as the one shown here, which is a simple butt weld in a, in a plate. And we're doing tests in a laboratory condition on the, what we call a constant amplitude stress loading, which means that the uh, 
the loading is repeated, but the magnitude of the loading doesn't change. We do the tests on a large number of samples, and we test at different uh, stress levels, uh, loading levels. And we test until a fatigue crack initiates and grows, let's say, um, until the crack grows through the thickness. Um, now, the, the definition of fatigue cracking is, is to some extent arbitrary. But in this case, let's say that we are considering cracking all the way through the thickness. If then we um, plot the results of the test on, um, on a stress uh, versus number of cycles uh, uh, plot, which we call SN, um, we can see that for a certain stress range level, um, the number of cycles to failure is not really constant. It's, it, there is variation uh, in that number of cycles. But this presentation of the data doesn't give us a lot of um, insight. So as the case is with um, assessment of data from experiments, we can change the, the way we view the data. And if we now move or plot this to a log-log axis uh, plane, um, we can see a trend. Um, well, first of all, this trend is as expected um, as you move to um, larger stress ranges. It will take fewer number of cycles for the, for the sample or the component to, to crack. Um, also, this isn't a line. It's a, if anything, it's a fuzzy line. There is a scatter um, in the data. And this is a natural scatter in fatigue, which ca cannot be improved by um, better testing. And I'll get, get back to this uh, later. We can fit a line to the data um, to better see the, the trend and um, conjecture on what will happen if we extrapolate, um, or for the sake of more accuracy, we can uh, get some further improvement to the fit if we fit two lines to data with two different slopes, as the case is shown here. Now, we have this data from our tests, but ideally, this we should be able to use this in, uh, in practical design applications. So to design uh, for the design to be reasonably safe against fatigue, we can add a margin to this, um, to the fit, to the red fit. And this is shown in the, with the black line here, which is called the design curve. So we have added the margin, we have brought the stresses down. So now what this means is that um, if you want the component to withstand a certain number of load cycles, um, you would allow a smaller stress than the test data gave you. Um, and this would give us a reasonable safety margin to against fatigue. Um, how safe is the design curve? Depends on how further down we bring this, this curve and also depends on the um, statistical nature of the data. Uh, to begin with. Okay, now on, on, on the other side, um, after we have, to, we have done tests and we have established a design curve, we would like to use this design curve in, in assessment to see what this actually means in terms of um, pre predictions um, for uh, fatigue lives. So let's assume that we have used our design curve and we've calculated a fatigue SN life of 20 years. Um, using the design curve. What does this actually mean in, in, in reality? Well, to begin with, if, if we want to be trivial, um, this means that after 20 years of loading, the parameter called damage equals one. This is actually the definition of uh, the damage parameter, which is a fatigue damage parameter. But this actually hasn't answered any, any real questions. What does this number actually mean? Um, 
At this stage, we can't really say more until we do further assessment of the data. Um, all we can say is that the damage parameter of one corresponds to a certain probability of cracking. Um, and it's, it's important here to, to point out that the, the term calculated fatigue life is not the same as fatigue life. Um, fatigue life is the time it takes for a component or a specimen to, to crack, basically. Um, but the calculated fatigue life is our attempt to estimate the fatigue life. And there is usually some safety margin in that. So our calculated fatigue life is used usually um, several times um, out from the actual fatigue life. And this is in, done in purpose so that there is some safety in, um, in the calculations. Okay, so with this brief background, let's look at some of the guide documents. I've listed a few of the uh, current guide documents um, on, on fatigue. Um, th there is more, there is also the ISO documents and, and a few others. Um, my focus here is mainly on the offshore uh, applications um, and what is currently used. All of these documents have evolved um, through time and um, parts and bits have been improved and added and, and removed from these documents. Um, but one thing that's, that's common in, in these documents is that all of these cover certain aspects of, of the fatigue phenomenon. Uh, I'm, I'm here only considering SN fatigue and not fracture mechanics, although some of, some of these documents may also refer to fracture mechanics, but the primary purpose um, in, in their fatigue clauses is to deal with SN calculations. The basic aspects that are common in all of these is, um, first of all, that they all have um, different classes or different curves for different details, and by different details, what's meant is details such as whether the, we are considering the parent material or whether we are considering the weld, and if it's a weld, what type of weld it is, etc. So different curves are usually given, um, or different types of calculations are usually given for different details. Um, there is also the effect of environment. Environment affects fatigue. Um, so this could be temperature at higher temperatures. Um, material behave dif differently, um, and they uh, their resistance to fatigue could be different, and also at different environments such as um, the seawater environment, which is a corrosive environment, um, it's been observed that um, rate of fatigue is, is faster. There's an acceleration of fatigue in, in corrosion. Um, and for the offshore industry, this is, a, this is an important um, uh, topic to consider. Um, the SN curves typically are uh, for in-air conditions and for free corrosion conditions. And in the case in between the two is with uh, cathodic protection. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly later. Um, and these documents uh, intend, or the, the aspiration of these documents is to give a the SN curves that can be used for design or some guidance on design. So uh, what margin of safety is introduced in the data, um, in the experimental data, um, depends on the method that's um, recommended in the document. Could be um, the MSF, which is a factor on stress, or could be DSF, which is a factor on um, life or damage, or could be the, the actual definition of a design curve. Um, by what margin, which means by how many standard deviations in statistical terms, we are mm, moving away from the mean curve. There are also other refinements and improvements uh, in these um, codes and standards, which is, it varies case by case. Now let's go back to our um, design curve. And let's assume as some of the standards do. Let's assume that the design curve is 
two standard deviations away from the mean. So as you see, the design curve falls below the data, and let's assume that the distance that it falls below the mean is two standard deviations. Um, for this curve, we can actually calculate the probabilities of failure, and this is just a mathematical exercise. Um, the damage parameter of one, which is shown on the horizontal axis, um, corresponds to a certain probability f of failure, which is represented on the vertical axis. Um, uh, and you note that as the damage parameter increases, which means as the component or the structure experiences more time under the same cyclic loading, the probability of fatigue failure increases. And what is meant by this accumulated probability is the probability that a crack has initiated and developed at some point by the time that we are considering. So at a damage of one, um, the probability, the accumulated probability of fatigue failure is 2.3%. And this is just following the mathematics of the SN data from test and the fact that we have moved the design curve to standard deviations from the mean curve. But in reality, um, that's not all that affects the probability um, of failure and therefore the accuracy or reliability of our calculations. Um, let's, let's consider what else can affect this probability. A figure above shows the um, load resistance in a, in a illustrative manner. This isn't a, a rigorous uh, exercise. Um, in a laboratory condition, we can assume that we have near perfect knowledge of the loading. Therefore, I've represented the load as a vertical line. So it doesn't have any, any scatter. Um, whereas fatigue resistance is the natural resistance to, to fatigue, it has to do with the, with the sample, with the welding, etc. It's outside um, of our control when we're doing the test, and it has a distribution. Um, now, if we consider that in real applications, uh, such as, as assessment of offshore structures, which is one application, um, for fatigue calculations, um, we rarely have a perfect knowledge of loads and stresses. Although we try to do um, as accurate as possible calculation, um, there will be some uncertainty in our load calculations. So the loading, um, the red curve in the figure below, which is our calculated loading in a typical offshore calculation um, has the same nominal value or the mean value as the one in the lab condition. Um, but the probability of um, cracking or probability of fatigue is different. Uh, if you look at the interference between the, the two uh, curves, the, for where we have a our load and resistance uh, curve um, interference at the top, um, I've shown the, the, the area that we know is um, uh, presents the probability of fatigue cracking. But the figure below um, shows that the, the area of interference is much, it's much larger. Um, and this is a, a feature of our calculation. But let me just first add that these are just illustrative examples. These are not rigorous probabilistic assessment. This is just for um, uh, demonstration purposes. Um, and, this, and the resistance model in the second uh, um, graph, which is the one below, is not quite right. It, it, can't, it shouldn't be the same as the one above, but let's, let's, let's go with this for now. And the reason that it shouldn't be, it's not quite true, is because where you have um, variable amplitude loading, such as the offshore environment, it's not quite true to say 
um, that the resistance is the same because the resistance um, there is also more uh, scatter in the resistance where there is a variable amplitude. But this is this is just a very simple, let's say, non-scientific um, demonstration. Now, if we go into the mathematics of it and try to see what the numbers actually tell us, um, I'm presenting the the same uh, plot, but it's now the vertical axis is in, inverted this time. So as we move down, the probability increases. Um, the blue curve shows the fatigue in the laboratory condition, and the orange line um, shows our calculations from in, a, in an offshore loading environment, the typical calculation. Um, what this shows is that after 20 years of loading for both cases, um, which corresponds to a damage of one for both cases, um, the probability of uh, having a crack in, the, in our offshore structure is larger than the probability um, in the um, lab condition. Um, and the reason for this is our lack of certainty in our stresses. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And if we consider the, this probability of cracking at halfway through the design life, um, which would be a damage of 0.5 uh, for all cases, um, let's say if the, the SN life, calculated life, is 20 years, this corresponds to tw uh, 10 years of service, um, we see that the probability in the real case is much, much larger by more than an order of magnitude, one and a half order of magnitude larger than the the one in the lab condition. And this is quite important because uh, this, this difference is due to our calculations. This is due to our uncertainty in the stresses. But in applications, in real life applications, and offshore structures is a good example of this, and lots of studies have happened for uh, taken place for off, for offshore applications. Um, this has been we have, we have attempted to quantify this difference um, by improving our understanding of the inputs. We can improve our the, uh, calculations. That is the probabilities um, of our calculations, but the probability can never be better than the blue blue curve. It can never be better than the natural scatter uncertainty in the, in the SN data. So here is a figure that shows this effect of uncertainty in stresses in, in more detail. Similar to the previous slides, the time is on the x-axis with probability of fatigue on the vertical axis. The um, top curve, uh, that's that's the blue line, is the SN only, which is the laboratory condition. And then the family of the curves below it uh, represent different typical conditions in um, in offshore fatigue calculations. What changes between them is really just the level of uncertainty in the stresses. Uh, the stress values in reality are unchanged. Um, it's just our understanding and confidence, so to speak, that varies between the curves. Um, wh one other thing to note here is that at the end of the design life of 20 years, uh, probability of failure is quite large. It's uh, around 10% or, or a bit higher, uh, but it's not one and doesn't become 100%. We may actually move beyond this point. And if we do this, um, we can go beyond uh, damage of one, uh, and this is shown in this figure. Um, and if you have an appetite for accepting higher probabilities of failure, um, you can move to um, damages of two, three, five, etc. And you see that from uh, these curves, the probability increases with time or with damage, uh, but it never becomes one. You can never say for certain when 
the component or structure actually fails. Of course, within reason, but this is also another feature of the statistics that we are using in our, in our calculation. So, so far, it's been quite abstract. I'll, I'll try to use all of these um, uh, illustrations in a simple case um, and see how we can actually use fatigue calculations that, that's, that's currently out there in, uh, in guidelines and codes. Let's assume that we have an offshore platform. Um, so assume the, the picture on the left-hand side, but assume it to be in water. Um, and it's designed for a life of 20 years. So that is the designed service life of the platform. Um, and let's say that we have done fatigue calculations um, for two details, detail A and detail B. Uh, shown on the right hand side and um, detail A is giving a calculated life of 80 years. This is uh, using the design curve and detail B is giving four years, uh, which is much shorter. But on the other hand, um, although detail B is giving shorter life, um, let's also assume that the fit of detail B is less important, less consequential than failure of point A. So let's see how we can bring all this knowledge into um, trying to set some inspection planning um, for these two details. Okay, considering detail A it has a calculated life of 80 years, we're trying to maintain a probability better or lower than 10 to the minus three. So this means that by the end of its service life, which is 20 years, we want to make sure that um, the probability of cracking uh, is less than one in a thousand. We can do this uh, by looking at the figure on the right hand side, the, the plot. We want to be in the region which is blue, so those are probabilities better than 10 to the minus three. Um, damage of one equals 80 years because the calculated SN is 80 years. And therefore, the 20 years in service, which is the design life, corresponds to 0 0.25 damage, which is shown by the vertical red line. Okay, now depending on which curve we use from that cluster of curves, uh, we can see how this probability evolves over time. Uh, let's say that we get our loading or stresses in our calculations from a finite element analysis or a typical um, current best practice uh, calculation, but we don't have any measurement to, to back up our calculation. So we have some uncertainty in our stress, but we have done a good job, basically. Um, you see that as um, we move along the, the lowest curve, you start at very high very low, sorry, probabilities at the top. And that probability rapidly increases over time. And by where the blue vertical line is, you hit the 10 to the minus three probability. Um, beyond that, um, the probability it becomes unacceptable. So you have to do something by that time. And typically, it's, it's an inspection event. You can inspect and then you can do an update to your understanding of the structure and lift the curve up again. I'm not going to go into that detail here. Um, so if we use the, the readings from this curve, uh, we find that that point corresponds to a time of 14.4 years. So for 20 years in service, you need to do an inspection after, but no later than 14 years into service. Now let's consider the same problem, same analysis, same calculation, but we have also got uh, some backup from measurements. We have good strain gauge data and good confidence in stresses. So we can reduce the, um, the what we call the COV in, the, in our loading and move to a better curve. Um, so we move to the, to the second uh, higher uh, curve here. Um, and where that curve hits the 10 to the minus three probability corresponds to a damage of 0 0.25, which is 20 years 
uh, of life. So the first inspection or first um, mitigating action is is due uh, no later than 20 years. So you may actually get away with no inspection. So this the, the difference between these two cases, one was 14 years and the other is 20 years, is solely to do with our confidence in the stresses. The calculations are using the same stresses, the same loads. It's just that our confidence in the values as, uh, was increased in the second case. So we could benefit from that in terms of inspection. Now, similarly, for the other detail, which has a life of four years, um, uh, this time, by the end of service life, which is 20 years, we, we are going to large damages, damage of uh, five in this case. And this is what is shown here. So damage of one equals four years. And that's the first vertical line. The second vertical line is 20 years of service, which corresponds to a damage of five in this case. Um, let's say in this case, we, we don't need a 10 to the minus three probability. We are happy with a um, one in 100 uh, chance of cracking because the consequence of cracking is lower. Um, so we want to save some money on inspection. Um, again, if we consider that the loads are from FE, and uh, this time following the 10 to the minus two probability line, um, we find that the um, latest allowable time to do any action is at the damage of 0 0.34, which corresponds to a time in service of 1.36 years. So I'll, I'll have to say something in brackets here. Um, we have to be very careful when we talk about fractions of a year in, in offshore applications because the resolution, the loading um, input doesn't have that sort of resolution. Month by month, the loading can be different. Um, but I'm, I'm just showing this here for illustration purposes, it's just um, to be able to compare the numbers mathematically. Okay, now, same case, if we have um, higher confidence in our stresses from um, finite element uh, measurement alongside uh, sorry, finite element calculations alongside strain gauge measurements, for example, over a, a reasonably long period, we can benefit from this understanding and um, delay the inspection. So this can be moved to 1.84 years. It's not much of an improvement compared to the 1.36 of a year, but it's, it's the numbers that, it, that are, I'm trying to illustrate here. In both cases, it means that you need to inspect after year one and before year two. Um, so there isn't really much difference between the two, two cases. Um, now, here's the, the important part. Um, there are some other codes that recently um, have been, have come to existence um, and have added these clauses um, to them, such as the NORSOC N005, which is a Norwegian uh, offshore code that highlights that the use of this uh, probability uh, scaling, which we have done, uh, is not quite accurate. So if we do a detailed probabilistic assessment, which I've done in the background, not going into that detail here, um, what the for for detail A, when our calculations using um, the PF graph from codes gave us a time to inspection of 14 years, the probabilistic assessment, detailed assessment, gives us a time to inspection of 10 years, um, which means that using the the code um, values uh, of PF for inspection planning is actually unsafe in this case. Uh, for detail B, on the other hand, uh, using the, doing a, a full probabilistic assessment, um, we find that the time to first inspection could be two years rather than 1.4 years. So we get some improvements uh, in, in shorter lives. But it's mainly in the, in the longer lives that is the current structures are designed for. And for some one or another reason, let's say the occurrence of corrosion or changing uh, loading regime, etc., they have moved to a shorter calculated life that you need inspection. We have to be very careful that using 
the code scaling uh, probabilities for um, for inspection can be unsafe. So I think this illustrates a, a complex aspect of these codes, maybe justifies the need for a more detailed case-by-case -case analysis when consequence of the failure is, is high, when there is a high risks at stake, it's, it's probably uh, worthwhile doing a detailed case-by-case -case assessment rather than following the guidelines only. Okay, um, I've um, tried to cover a number of aspects of fatigue assessment, um, starting with the basics of testing and the uh, statistics um, to the setting of the time for first inspection, uh, all in the context of um, integrity management. Um, codes don't explicitly mention this, but the PF curve um, and the, the DFFs or the design uh, fatigue factors in codes are derived for a narrow range of specific cases, as, as I've mentioned here. The definition of what cracking means also depends on what is acceptable in reality um, versus what was achieved in the experimental data behind code and the SN curves. Um, sometimes in, in operation, a limiting failure may not necessarily be the, uh, the severance of a component, but rather an event that leads to a high cost of repair, for example. So a smaller crack, but expensive to repair. Um, and also if, if, a, if a calculated inspection is due, can it wait? And for how long? Um, well, this depends on a number of things, such as the um, expected increase in the calculated risk, um, and also considerations of whether there is redundancy and what are the consequences of uh, cracking, etc. cetera. Um, and finally, um, there are also various other aspects of um, fatigue codes and our current understanding which uh, require further improvement. As an example, we try to design away from corrosion, but it's a, it's a fact of life that these things happen. And we need, we need to be equipped with reliable analysis tools when these things happen. There is also a um, growing tendency uh, these days, in particular in design of offshore wind structures, to move to larger and thicker sections. So the current thickness or size effect uh, correction that we use is, is not really tested for the large modern wells. Um, these um, and, a and a few other items are areas for improvement. Um, but the intention of this presentation has been to cover the current guidelines. Um, I think we can now open the floor to the questions. Uh, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Amir. Really interesting talk. Um, it is certainly a challenge to accurately capture the uncertainties in the offshore world and be able to relate this back to uh, the use of, of lab test results. Um, so I'll open up the floor now for, for questions. Um, whilst we wait for them to come through, I have a couple of questions myself. Um, first one being, how reliable are inspections and, and what are the standard ways to try and minimise fatigue where possible? Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, can, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's 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 two questions. Good questions. Um, how reliable are inspections? Um, well, uh, there was a time. I think it was in the nineties, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, people started looking at the reliability of uh, inspection methods and by inspection in this context i'm i'm talking about um in inspections for um for cracks in uh, in structures and in, in particular offshore um and they came up with two two concepts of uh, probability of detection and probability of sizing pod curves and probability of sizing 
Um, and this this has to do with the um, with the actual mechanics and, and physics of the inspection method, um, and to to some extent, especially in the, in the old days, uh, there there is an element of, of human factor in in these um, probabilities. But uh, but I guess these days uh, that the, we are we are seeing improved uh, methods. So cut, cut a long story short, there is. You you can never say that by inspection you have hundred percent after an inspection you have hundred percent certainty that there are no cracks in the structure. Um, so there there will, but what you can do is you can say that there is a very high probability that there are no cracks above this certain size, uh, but below what was for smaller cracks, um, that probability of detection becomes. Uh, becomes smaller, it's, it's, uh, becomes more difficult to detect uh, smaller cracks. Obviously, it also depends on the on the particular case. If it's a complex geometry, access is, is difficult, and um, and the, the inspection method, whether you, you are using, I don't know, some of the common inspection methods, ACFM or MPI, or whether we are looking at the uh, other surface, the far surface. Um, so that, that's the, the POD, which is now brought into the um, calculations for inspection planning. Um, and people do sometimes do trials uh, uh, to, um, to develop POD curves. Um, and um, in terms of the probability of sizing, um, that is uh, now, I must say, in, in our industry, that's probably less relevant because once you detect something, you try your best to use the best methods to uh, to do as accurate sizing as possible. So sorry, I'm just just uh, it's, it was a long answer. So the the other part of the question was uh, something to do about um, yeah, how we can it, um, minimize fatigue. Minimize fatigue, yes. Um, okay, so that that's also a good question. I think the we want to um, design uh, for fatigue to to um, structures to withstand uh, cyclic loading and also we want to design to, uh, and, and our structure to be robust in terms of fatigue so um, I guess the best best thing is to, to design it uh, with a margin in the first place um, but I understand that that's not always possible with the demand of, of lighter and uh, um, cheaper or less expensive structures so there, there are other methods um, where you can uh, improve the the appearance of the of the weld by grinding, or um, can introduce residual stresses by uh, peening methods uh, such as hammer peening, etc. Um, so yeah, I would say the best thing is to to do it at source during design. But when it comes to it, analysis of an existing structure, that 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 avenue is closed. So it's uh, to do it, weld improvements usually is the uh, is the way forward. Brilliant. Thanks, Samir. Um, looks like we've got some questions coming through the uh, chat box now. So I'll start with uh, Jonathan Fuller. Please, can you explain a bit more the COV differences on the graphs and how they are determined? Great presentation. Thanks, John. Well, thanks. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, so the, the typical, well, the COV has to do with um, how, how much certainty we have in our um, in our calculations, um, and uh, it is assuming that we we have we have generally got the uh, the mean value uh, correct or close to to correct, but um, we have um, there is a certain possibility that the, the stress could be ten percent higher or ten percent lower, assuming it's a it's a symmetrical. Uh, Distribution. Um, um, th there are no. Um, it's it's really difficult to to get the COV right, but there are uh, some guidance um, in um, in some of the standards uh, about the choice of COVs, and they they usually depend on the method that we have used to to calculate stresses. So if we are using a, a finite element analysis which is which we have 
good good confidence in, but we are not using uh, we are not modeling the uh, the weld, uh, and we are relying on the stress concentration factors from uh, from code for tubular connections. For example, you have a, a larger COV and a smaller COV if you have a a more refined uh, finite element analysis. Um, and also, it's not all to do with the, the finite element analysis. It's also um, if if you have um, the, the other two sides of the argument is one if you have measurement of stresses that that that's a, that's a good certainty. So COV becomes smaller, so you can use five percent or, or uh, if, if you want to be cautious, ten percent. Um, and if you um, if you know about the uh, the, the source of loading. So if you have measured the, the wave heights, for example, uh, that would also lead in, in, to smaller COVs. But uh, to, to, to say how it's, um, how to come up with the exact number, there is no uh, guidance at the moment. So it's, it's really uh, based on uh, what people call expert elicitation. And there are some guidances in, uh, in particular in DNV, uh, is it uh, RPC? 210, I think, which is to do with the um, probabilistic uh, inspection planning. I hope that answers uh, your question. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to a question from Stuart Smith. Uh, when considering the effects of corrosion, is this purely a case of understanding the material loss and its effect on the stress range, or are there other factors to consider? Uh, Thanks, Stuart. So the, uh, it, it, there is an aspect of um, thickness loss, but there is more in, in fatigue. So thickness, thickness loss is something that we can deal with um, in, in, our, in the calculation of our stresses. But the response of the material to uh, fatigue itself, um, cyclic loading itself, changes. And it's broadly, and I'm being a bit crude here, but let's, let's just go with it. Broadly speaking, two um, Two, um, two aspects. One is the um, that, that corrosion would uh, typically cause uh, a change in the surface appearance and and roughness. And sometimes you, you can even um, uh, initiate pits on the surface of steel. Um, and that means that the the material is is no longer the same as the material that you did the tests on. So your the, the fatigue behavior changes because of the change of the surface conditions. And the the other uh, aspect is uh, once a crack is established, a growing crack uh, response to corrosion is is different. So you, for a growing crack in a in a corrosive environment, the rate is um, is faster. Rate of growth is basically those those two um, aspects, and also the the thickness loss. Great, thanks, Amir. Um, a question from John: How close can you reasonably expect the improved curves to get to the SN curves? In the examples, the curves still seem a long way away from the SN curves. Okay, so that's uh, that's also a good question. The the, the issue is that the um, the the source SN curves that has the smallest scatter, which is the laboratory condition, um, is the best we can do is to do it to derive them for a uh, for a specific application. Um, but in reality, if you if you have a variable amplitude um, loading situation, um, the the sequencing of the stress cycles has some some effect on uh, how um, how the material um, behaves in terms of Miner's rule, which is the adding of the damages, so that's that's uh, that's that's a big aspect uh, that that causes the separation of those curves is the variable amplitude um, aspect of it. Um, in terms of the other um, uncertainties, if we have if you have perfect knowledge, let's say uh, hypothetically, have perfect knowledge of the stresses. It's it's really only the the miners uh, rule um, that that's still causing some uh, some issue. It, it haven't there are lots of lots of research has happened, but uh, hasn't actually been able to give a uh, a 
an exact uh, answer uh, if that that answers your question. Thanks, Amir. <clears throat> Moving on, um, Moses got a question. What is the reference to FE loads? Are loads not specified by codes and standards? Uh, yes, uh, good question. They they are when you are designing, uh, um, and you don't you don't want to uh, uh, exceed a certain um, certain load. It's not the load that's that's defined in codes and standards. It's the um, it's the normalized load. So for a um, strength uh, check, for example, you want to be a certain no more than a certain percentage of your yield stress. Uh, so that's how the loads are defined. But that's in in design. Um, in, in in reality, uh, when you do assessment of existing structures, um, you should you should put in the the loading that the structure has actually experienced. Um, and um, in in some applications, that may be uh, specified by design. But in in the applications that I'm, I'm talking about here, which is offshore structures, um, it, it really depends on the on the environmental loading. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Amir. Um, ben has got a question. You mentioned a lot of codes are based on SN rather than fracture mechanics. Is there a reason for this? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is there a reason for it? yes? So uh, the, I think historically it was first uh, SN that was that was developed our understanding about fatigue first developed as uh, resistance to repeated loading and then the link between uh, crack growth and fatigue came a bit later. Um, I think in in today's applications it's basically because SN is uh, is um, I don't want to say more elegant, but it it also captures the initiation of a of a crack. So in a in a in a component that's not a welded component, let's say, um, there are basically two two phases. There may be more, but let's just say two main phases. One is the initiation for for fatigue, and then the next is is crack growth. Um, Fracture mechanics uh, covers the crack growth part, but the initiation is will be captured experimentally in SN. So SN, in a, in a sense, is more empirical and therefore can be closer to our uh, our case, and we can do uh, tests uh, tests uh, for it. Um, that, that's I think that's probably the reason. Brilliant. Um, moving on, a few more to get through. Thanks, Amir. Uh, so David's got a question here. You have not said very much about variable amplitude loading. For example, how are these complex load histories converted into constant amplitude data to use in the analysis? Yes, that's also a good observation. So um, I, I can just give an give the example of um, offshore structures. Um, um, we say that if if the loading comes from um, the environmental um, loading, so it's Purely wind and wave, etc., um, and there is no live load on the structure itself, um, such as a turbine. Um, then it's we should really look at the the envir the the environmental loading and how it repeats itself. Um, observation has shown that uh, the environmental loading from one year to another is reasonably repeatable, actually quite repeatable, and uh, people uh, gather this this data. Um, over years and years, um, and there are databases of um, the env um, environmental loading um, or environmental conditions, which actually give you the loading. Um, therefore, it's 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 enough then for us to look at one year. Typically, if there isn't a lot of variability between between one year and the next, uh, and we come up with the we reduce the load to the annual. Um, Loading or the annual annualized uh, histogram of of loading, um, and then it's it's how what level of resolution you want to have in the uh, in the in the loading. So we say with in this year in the in the in the period of one year, um, we have ten thousand of uh, stress cycles that are of a certain amplitude and we have another 20,000 stresses of a smaller amplitude etc and um, 
you basically map the year to a histogram of stress ranges uh, versus number of cycles. Um, and that's the way you, you deal with it. So then, then for each uh, stress, for, for each um, bin um, with a number of uh, cycles, you assume that to be a constant amplitude. So that's how we break this. I, I hope it was uh, clear. Yeah, very nice answer. Thanks, Samir. Um, so James has got a question here. How are appropriate loading conditions determined for the FE analysis of a particular structure, the results of which go into the fatigue calculation? Um, if I if I understand this correctly, um, so there, there are two two aspects uh, to to any, to any design. F first of all, you you would like to um, make sure that your the damage parameter doesn't exceed a certain value, um, and you, you design for that. Um, but then that is assumptions in your design what the loading is going to be. But once the structure is out there and is experiencing the, the loading, you may want to um, to adjust and calibrate uh, your your stresses um, because you, you may you may have learned more. Um, you may have put strain gauges on the structure, um, etc. Um, the appropriateness of loading uh, conditions determined from FE um, is is basically it depends on how complex the structure behavior behavior is. If we are talking about a a monopile, and if you um, if you know what the expected uh, moat shapes are, and it's, it's it's let's say it's a simple cantilever, um, then stresses from FE can be quite quite accurate. Uh, of course, there is always the boundary conditions, etc., to to consider. So there is no general rule of um, how appropriate the uh, a, a method is. But sometimes FE is really the only method we have. But it's it's always good practice if possible i know it's very expensive to do some measurements um, to try to calibrate our um, fe results because fe is relying on um, lots of assumptions such as the boundary conditions in the case of a monopile is the um, what's what's the fixity at the soil um, and the 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 mode shapes um, but uh, yeah generally fe sometimes fe is the only thing we have so we have to to live with it. Brilliant, thanks, Amir. Um, a few more to go. So, um, mm -hmm. Stefan here, uh, Stephen, sorry, has asked two questions. Um, first, how are the probability of failure curves derived? <laughs> Quite a big question. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second one is how is corrosion and surface pitting accounted for in the fatigue life calculations? I suppose that relates back to an earlier question from John. Yes. Okay. So the the first uh, question. So the probability of uh, failure curves are it's it's um it's it's mathematical. Um, Basically, if we, if we want to calculate the probability of failure, um, we need to have a good idea about the the different scatters that we are we are experiencing. Let's say we know the scatter in our uh, SN curve, um, and then you, usually the most straightforward way of doing this is to do a a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, so you you look at different um, realizations, and by by realization, I mean uh, one set of data that is a possibility among the, the different data. Let's say you have a um, input stress which has some variability um, in terms of the scatter, um, and then you have your SN resistance that has some uh, variability, some scatter. Uh, you start sampling um, different events or realizations. So you take one stress value from the cloud of stresses that you have and take another random resistance and check if there was a failure or not. And then you, you repeat this and you build up the uh, the picture. If you if you are looking for probabilities of one in a hundred or one in a thousand, our sample in a Monte Carlo simulation should have one or two orders of magnitude um, higher. So we need to do 
a, a thousand or ten thousand um, um, uh, samples. But it's it's uh, the Monte Carlo simulation is is uh, usually the best uh, method that's that's used. The other question was about uh, uh, pitting. How is that included in the in the analysis? Uh, it's it's simply um, in the SN data um, in in design documents that that show the SN data. Um, the free corrosion um, curves, where where, it, um, where you don't have any protection against corrosion in seawater, um, are usually derived for um, for representative conditions. So um, the the component has been left in a corrosive environment long enough that it has developed um, uh, the the surface condition, uh, which has pitting or change of roughness, et cetera. And then those uh, samples were tested. So that, that has been captured in the testing. Um, but of course, there, it, 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 there, is the, there are some nuances here that are not quite easy to capture, um, such as um, the, the long-term effect of corrosion. Um, because if you think about corrosion, the structure has been in, in service for 20 years and it's experienced uh, corrosion. And if you are considering free corrosion, no lab test lasted 20 years. <laughs> so there has been some acceleration done in, uh, in um, uh, provoking the material to corrode faster uh, in, in some cases. Um, and that's that's where the some of the larger uncertainties come from. But it is to, sorry. The, the the short answer to the question is that the, the, it's, it's tried to include these in the um, ascent curves for free corrosion. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Amir. Um, so I've noticed we're a couple of minutes over. We've got four more questions. Are you okay to, on time, uh, yeah, Amir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sure. Okay. Um, so Errol's asked, hi, how would a single overstress event, e.g. a storm or a hurricane, affect these calculations slash assumptions? Yeah, that's a very good question. So there are a few things um, happening in a, in, a, in a weld, for example, um, even, even when there is no, um, no crack or no crack has initiated, the, the overstress event could uh, result in some change or relief in the uh, residual stresses, uh, uh, and that's not something that that's currently easy to to capture in a in an SN calculation. Although there are guidelines for um, the stress ratio effect. So let's let's say there is a weld, and you've had a you've experienced a storm, a, a an overstress, um, and um, you can then look at the stress in that weld during that storm. Um, and see if you are expecting that stress to to have caused any um, any relaxation of the residual stresses, and if you can quantify that, um, then you could say that this this weld is, um, although it has experienced some uh, high stresses, but the the residual stresses are no longer as onerous as the uh, as it used to be uh, when it wasn't, um, assuming it wasn't heat treated, so you had residual stresses. So that's one side of the argument. The other side is that if you have a, if there is a crack, um, um, a, a single over overshoot of stress um, could generate large plastic zones ahead of the crack tip, um, and sometimes that would actually delay the the subsequent growth so that could be a um, although it's a damage uh, to the structure it's const constitutes a damage um, it it could um, result in a um, in, in a retardation uh, but just for a for just, just temporarily um, so it's it's really a case by case but it's uh, it, it's not an easy thing to uh, to assess I hope this answers the question. Yes, thank you very much, Amir. Um, Mike's got a question, um, again, relating to the loading conditions. The lab tests are in pure tension, so can these results be applied to structures under combined stress by comparing the FE's von Mises stress against the SN curve? Thanks, Mike. 
Okay, good question. So the the you can do tests in um, in representative uh, loading cases. Um, uh, actually, there was a time that people tried to do when you did a, a tension test. People tried to stay in the tensile region because there were limits on the um, hydraulic con um, se servo controllers that couldn't uh, go from compression to from tension to compression. But but these days you can actually do tests that go uh, from negative to to positive. And also in the in the old days people did um, the rotating bend. Uh, test which was a fully reversed um, stress uh, case um, and um, so th th that that's that's one aspect you can do the test in uh, um, for other r ratios for uh, so to speak um, the um, the other thing is that yes so if if you want to be represented the best thing is to do the test uh, that condition because that way you capture the the closure and you capture the um, benefit from from compression. Uh, currently um, in in SN, because a crack hasn't in initiated, hasn't um, started to grow yet at the beginning of the test, the uh, the closure argument is not really a valid um, argument. Um, but we can take benefit from from compression, and there are um, rules that you can actually benefit from uh, how compressive a, a a load cycle is, um, and this has changed a bit o over the the years, especially recently. Um, but it does give a give a benefit. But you have to be mindful that there are, there should be no residual stresses in the component in order to benefit from the um, compressive part of the stress cycle. And sometimes residual stresses could be just as a result of fabrication. So if you, it may not even be a weld, maybe just a plate, but the way it was fabricated means that you have tensile residual stresses um, that uh, a compressive uh, part to the stress cycle doesn't actually give us much benefit. But it, th there are rules, and uh, I can maybe refer you to the the DNV uh, code. Uh, RPC203, and there is a mean stress effect uh, section which explains uh, how to benefit from this. Thanks, Amir. Um, final couple of questions now. Um, one from Jun. Uh, regarding the test and check method, um, can visual checks still be reliable? And are there any sort of tools or equipment um, that will be uh, used or better to use? Um, generally, if, if this is about the in inspection for, for cracks, um, visual uh, inspection is not very uh, reliable uh, for cracks. It, again, depends on the, um, on the application and geometry. Um, but the, the good thing with visual inspection is that you may learn things that you didn't expect. So it's always a good, good idea to do a visual check uh, alongside any, um, any more advanced uh, check um the, the the thing with fatigue cracks is that they can be um hairline like they can be very very difficult to see um and the crack may not be open for a for some of the some parts of the stress cycle or um it may only open in during storm conditions etc so you won't be able to actually see the crack so it's always it's it's not as reliable as um, probe-based uh, inspection methods, uh, such as the uh, alternating current methods or uh, or UT methods, uh, but it's it's also it, it's it's always a good idea to um, to do the uh, probe-based inspection, but also do a visual inspection um, just just to just to make sure that there isn't anything we're missing. Brilliant, thanks. Um, so Roberts asked, is the COV the covariance of the statistical distribution? Uh, it is the coefficient of variation uh, of the statistical distribution of uh, the input. So for our stress, it's the um, <clears throat> yeah, coefficient of variation. Great, thanks. Final question. Um, 
how do you determine which is the correct number of stress cycles, i.e. if you have a higher frequency of lower stress cycles or a low frequency of high stress cycles occurring at the same time, which ones would you use for the curves? Okay, so that's uh, that's also a difficult one. Um, that is quite a difficult uh, situation, uh, I must say. Um, there, there are ways you can you can you can do some sense checks. Uh, see if you if you just look at the high frequency damage, what value of damage you get, and if you just look at the low frequency damage, what value of damage you get, and if one is much larger than the other. Um, of course, you, you, can, you can say that that's the dominant one, but that's 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 rarely the case. Um, what, one way to look at it is that if the frequencies are far apart, um, you may expect very little interaction between the two um, loading cycles, in which case you can say they are, to, to a reasonable extent, independent, and you can add the damages. But when they are not... Um, uh, the frequencies are quite close to each other. It becomes quite difficult. So sometimes in uh, in some applications, people actually do a time series uh, uh, sampling uh, for for fatigue. So you actually see what the combined uh, uh, stress cycles um, look like. But there is there are some some rules, but it's it's not an easy one to answer. Brilliant. Thanks, Amir. Um, that's all the questions now. Thanks again for your, your time today and a fantastic presentation. And thanks everyone for, for the great questions um, that you've submitted. Um, I believe the, there'll be a recording that will be available on the IMEC -E YouTube um, channel within uh, seven, seven days. But I think we're a bit over now, so we'll, we'll, we'll draw this to a, a close. And um, thank you very much again for, for your attendance today. Thank you.